and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Pipeless Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, we welcome our guest, Scott Fernandez, back to Populist Dialogues. He'll be making a presentation titled, The Future of Portland's Water, Your Heritage, Your Health. Scott Fernandez has a master's of science degree in biology, microbiology, having done graduate work in drinking water chemistry and microbiology. He is a mayor appointed member of the City of Portland Utility Review Board, as well as the City of Portland Water Quality Advisory Committee. So welcome back to the Populist Dialogue, Scott. Thank you for having me here Great. Yeah, right. So uh, you have a presentation that you want to do, so I'm just going to let you go right into it uh, without good. asking any questions because you know what you're talking about, and, okay. well, frankly, I don't. So Very good. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me again. Um, today we're going to be talking about the future of Bull Run drinking water, and we're going to be moving from the overall uh, aspect of the EPA uh, regulation that we're dealing with right now that would make us uh, cover our reservoirs and um, add treatment to the Bull Run drinking water. And we're going to be talking from the waiver to the situation that we're dealing with with City Council, also with the fluoridation of our drinking water. So we're going to talk about those two different issues and move along fairly quickly tonight. So the first slide you're looking at is a uh, picture of the Bull Run uh, watershed management area that where we get our sources of our drinking water. And this is a very important issue that we're dealing with just right off the top because this is a federally protected uh, watershed, one of the uh, only one in the United States and probably the world as it is right now. Uh, it is extremely pristine, unfiltered water that has no sewage exposure from municipal or agricultural or industrial sources. So it is unique in that it is not exposed to a bunch of toxic and, and carcinogenic chemicals in its source water and also human sourced microorganisms and contaminants like that. So that's the reason why we don't need to filter or add any treatment other than what we have currently of chlorine and ammonia. So the challenges that Portland sees over the next few years are very, very critical for the citizens of Portland and the surrounding areas that drink Bull Run water for, for us to, to observe as we go through the process over the next year or so. The first one that we deal with right now is, is a huge debt crisis with the Portland Water Bureau. Uh, last month they just uh, offered bonds of $161 million and this month they're going to be offering uh, $250 million worth of bonds to address the EPA regulation and other things that have been deferred in the uh, bull run and in the water system. So this is going to cause our rates to increase as they have over the last decade. They have doubled over the last decade because of this EPA regulation. And the second thing is, of course, the EPA long-term to enhance surface water treatment rule, which EPA is forcing us to cover our reservoirs and add treatment of ultraviolet radiation up at the Bull Run Headworks. And the third problem that we, ch we face is a, an intention of the uh, Water Bureau and the City of Council, especially, to uh, go in the direction of regionalization of our drinking water system, where all the different water utilities uh, come together and form a, a separate agency. And this was outlined in a plan in 2001 called the Regional Transmission and Storage Strategy, which outlined all these utilities working together and combining different water sources like the Willamette River, the Clackamas River, Hag Lake, the Columbia River, and Bull Run Waters all together, mixed together so we would have one water source. Privatization is the next thing. Once the regionalization process took place and was completed, the intention was to privatize all the water utilities uh, through a, a separate corporation that would oversee the contract for these water utilities. And as citizens, we would have no, uh, no voice in what was happening to our water. And the, the last thing is the fluoride chemicals. And those are going to be uh, coming up for a vote in May, May 21st, I believe. And so this is an important issue because the fluoride that we would be subjected to would not be pharmaceutical grade, but it would be industrial grade, and we'll go over that. It would be filled with high, high, lot, high amount of contamination that we'll see as we go through the next uh, slides. So the long-term solution for all of this is a drinking water waiver from the EPA. It would take all of this stuff off the table because we wouldn't have to cover our reservoirs. We could still have safe and healthy drinking water and add treatment to the bull run. 
So the next slide you're looking at shows the uh, new bond offerings that I was talking about from 161 million from last month and 250 million for this month. But it shows a sequential increase of, of water rates over the last decade. And this is published from the Portland Water Bureau. So this is, this is from their information. It shows significant increases to all of our, our water bills for a problem, a public health problem that doesn't exist uh, and never will because we don't have sewage exposure in our bull run. And this is what we need to keep in mind as we move forward and address the city council and address our congressional delegation that we want a waiver that would exempt us from this EPA regulation for a public health problem that doesn't exist. And these rate increases do not include the increases of charges on our water and sewer bill that come under the base charges. Those are going up double every uh, in the last decade also. And there's no incentive for the City of Portland City Council to keep our water rates and, and sewer rates uh, within a, 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 a regular margin of, of increase, which would be around 5 or 6 percent. These are in double digits in most of them every year. Uh, because they have an incentive to increase our water rates because 5 percent of all of our water and sewer bills goes back into the city's general fund, which allows them to spend on things that we may or may not need. It's, it's up to their discretion. So they have no incentive to keep our, our water rates and sewer rates contained. One of the good things that we see uh, that took place uh, last year was that the EPA admitted that when we request our waiver and review our, our system through this EPA regulation that, that, as they say, quote, science will drive our ultimate decision, that's a good thing for us because we have science in our, in our favor. Science has supported everything that we've said over the last decade that we do not need this. We have not found cryptosporidium, which is the parasite that they're trying to identify very often in our in our watershed and it's been many many years since we have found it and it has not our watershed and in, in the open reservoirs have never had a public health problem from microorganisms or chemicals and this is a big bonus for us and in fact the open reservoirs as we see provide a significant public health benefit to us and we'll go over that in just a few minutes the next slide you're looking at is a very stark contrast of what our watershed is and where the source of this EPA regulation came from uh, 20 years ago. Our bull run water, of course, is pristine and, and, and not exposed to sewage and chemicals. The, in, the, the reason for this EPA regulation happened 20 years ago this month in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when they had a catastrophic sewage event where sewage water ended up in Lake Michigan and was taken in by their water treatment plant it was not functioning properly and a lot of people got sick. Well, they got sick because they were drinking partially treated sewage and they did that for over a month. That's going to make people sick. And there's no, there's no reason to not believe that, but EPA uh, identified only cryptosporidium as the source of the, of the microorganism that was causing this problem when we know that sewage has hundreds of disease-causing microorganisms. So this doesn't make sense and this is a big benefit to us because we don't have the sewage and we don't have cryptosporidium as a problem. So what is a waiver? A waiver is a simple agreement between EPA and the City of Portland saying that they would exempt us on a scientific basis, which we have the evidence to show, that they would exempt us from this regulation because it would, exact, it would, it would actually degrade our drinking water chemically, as we'll see in just a little bit. Going back to this Milwaukee situation that took place 20 years ago, EPA said that, uh, that we would have surface outbreaks from cryptosporidium and that people would die from cryptosporidium over the last 20 years and that communities would see a lot of disease from cryptosporidium and drinking water from surface utilities. When in fact, over the last 20 years, zero people have died from cryptosporidium in surface water utilities. Zero surface water utility outbreaks have occurred and zero evidence of community disease from cryptosporidium and drinking water. Zero of all these counts from around the nation from every surface water utility, whether they were filtered or unfiltered. There's no reason for this regulation applying to us. The next thing you'll see here is, is a, uh, an example of the ultraviolet radiation unit that, would, that the city council plans to put in our, our bull run watershed. This would cost over $100 million for a problem that doesn't exist. In this ultraviolet radiation process, 
that generates formaldehyde, aldehyde, ozones, and other toxic chemicals. It also has a problem in, uh, it is, the unit itself is, is uh, filled with mercury contained light bulbs that supposedly work in affecting the disinfection process. But what we've seen in our test plant over on Airport Way is that these mercury bulbs have a, a history of breaking. And when they break, they introduce mercury into the drinking water. But the plan up at the Bull Run watershed is that there's no facility there to capture this mercury before it goes into the conduits that come into Pal Butte and into our distribution system. We think this is a big problem that they've overlooked in the, in the design of this plant. So this is one of the reasons we're objecting to this ultraviolet radiation. And that is stated in their, their plans for, for the design. The next thing we see here is a, uh, the Pal Butte 2 reservoir that's being built right now. For no reason, this is $135 million that has been wasted. They say we need it for extra reservoir space, but we don't because we have over capacity in our, our, our system right now. Reservoir 6 at, at, Tim, at Mount Tabor has been empty for years because we don't have the consumption. We've declined in consumption in the city of Portland and elsewhere over the years because of conservation and uh, standards for uh, low volume uh, toilets and things like that. So our, our water usage is going down significantly, which is a good thing because we can conserve very easily. But we've built this uh, reservoir for, for, for no need at this point. The next part of, that you'll see is, is what we will be looking for in the future if we continue down this road and don't get a waiver, that the regionalization process will begin to take place. And this is a picture of the Willamette River. This is one of the water sources that we'll be subjected to and all the contaminants that come with it. And what concerns the citizens of Portland is that the EPA only regulates 100, fewer than 100 chemicals. The EPA recognizes over 85,000 chemicals that are registered in the United States. So fewer than 100 in our drinking water coming from a contaminated source like the Willamette River is not much security. We would be getting a lot of toxic and carcinogenic contaminants that would be normally coming through the Willamette River through our drinking water. The privatization process that I've discussed is, is happening already. It's happened at Wilsonville at the, Wilson, at the Willamette River plant where a, a company called Veolia, it's a French company, has taken over their water and their sewer operations as kind of a pilot project for their contract uh, situation in the area. And Veolia is also working in in the uh, sewage part of the city of Gresham and the city of Vancouver. So this is, they're getting their, their ducks in order to privatize if, when the time comes. Indianapolis was a customer of Veolia in the 2000s. They stayed with them for, the city of Indianapolis stayed with them for about five years and because of problems with uh, increases of, of water rates and, and water quality problems and environmental problems and uh, so they told Veolia, we'll buy back the contract because you're doing such a poor job. We'll buy it back for $30 million and then we'll send you on your way and, and we'll make it into a, a public utility district like uh, other cities have. So they had very big problems with that. And uh, that's an example of what we can expect if we go to privatization. Fluoridation is another big issue that we're talking about. Fluoridation will also increase our costs to our, our water bills. The, the uh, fluoridation plant is, uh, is projected to cost, if it passes, and we hope it doesn't, uh, approximately five million dollars, but we've seen examples up to seven and eight million dollars for its cost to build, plus six hundred thousand dollars a year to operate, and that's a complete waste of money when we could turn that money into better hygiene, better, better dental hygiene programs for the students and, and children of this community. But that's what we'll be facing if we don't prevail and, and vote this down. One of the big reasons why we object to it is because fluoride chemicals that they'll be introducing are not pharmaceutical grade. They're not like the, the grade of chemicals that you put in your toothpaste or that you get at your dental office when they put a sealant on, the, on your teeth. These are very nasty chemicals. Industrial grade sources of chemicals, these are not inspected by the FDA or the EPA. These are overseen by a co an organization called the National Sanitation Foundation, which is funded by industry and, and federal grants. 
So we're talking these, farm, these industrial grade sources of chemicals that come from, for example, the Cargo Corporation, which supplies fertilizer uh, industry byproducts, is what these are, waste byproducts from these industries. Alcoa Corporation supplies these uh, fluoridation chemicals, and it's a product of the aluminum industry, a waste product. And also a group called Pelandaba Nuclear and the Chemical Corporation supplies these uh, fluoridation chemicals, uh, as fluoride is a big part of the enrichment of uranium for energy and for, for uh, nuclear warheads. So these are very, very toxic and carcinogenic chemical sources that would be added to our water that we aren't being told about. This next picture you'll see is a uh, picture of a bag of sodium fluoride, which this is being used in the Tualatin Valley Water District about 15 minutes west of here. They're the closest one to our fluoridation, and they are the second largest user of fluoride in the uh, state of Oregon. Uh, so this is something that we need to be careful of uh, in, in, in our selection and voting for the May, uh, May ballot. Uh, the, the label that it shows here is very clear. This is poison, toxin by ingestion, and target organs are the heart, the kidneys, the bones, the central nervous system, and this is on the label, and you'll see it uh, in your slide, uh, and the gastrointestinal system and teeth. This is sourced from China, so this has um, in their chemical summary, they show their arsenic and lead is present in addition to the fluoridation chemicals. So the fluoride water chemicals that are, are also listed in the National Sanitation Foundation list of, of chemicals are antimony, barium, chromium, lead, selenium, arsenic, cadmium, copper, mercury, and thallium. And Every, all these chemicals except thallium are hormone disruptors, which are very scary. These, have, these hormone disruptors have affinity for estrogen cell receptor sites, and this can affect breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovary cancer in women, and in, pro, in males, prostate cancer. So these things are not being disclosed when they talk about the chemicals that are involved with fluoridation. But we want to educate the community that these are in fact there as noted by the National Sanitation Foundation. What are these heavy metal impacts for the health? Again, these are hormone disruptor chemicals, but the cumulative effect is what our real concern is. These chemicals like lead begin to accumulate over time, especially with children because they are, are, not, uh, they are not adults. There are lead levels for adults, but they don't apply to children. These, le these chemicals, these heavy metals can cross the placenta for pregnant women and end up in, in the embryo and also the blood-brain barrier where they end up in your brain and can have cognitive effects for children and adults. Again, there, for these heavy metals, there is no safe level for children. So the solution is preventive medicine such as diet, dental hygiene and nutritional education. This would solve the problem if the children had routine checkups and were taught how to do the brushing and flossing and dental hygiene that they need to have that they could use for the rest of their life and also the nutritional education so that they aren't continually exposed to high sugary drinks and foods and stuff that contributes to tartar and plaque and and debris on the teeth where that's where the, can, the, the, uh, the cavities begin so dental hygiene and, and nutritional education would solve the problem very easily Okay, so that covers what we need to for today, and one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that uh, you can find a more detailed source of information for this material on bullrunwaiver.org, which is our website, and bullrunwaiver.org, which is our Facebook site, and you can email me at bullrun, bullrunwaiver.org at gmail.com and I will be happy to answer all your questions and give you updated information. We are adding information to the website uh, currently, and it is, uh, it's going to be an ongoing website that will have updates uh, periodically and, and give you information that you need. So please vote no next month in fluoride and tell your friends and neighbors, and especially those with children, that this is not a safe uh, chemical that we would be exposed to. Thank you very much. Great. Good. Thank you, Scott. Uh, 
I, I want to emphasize to folks that Scott is talking about uh, the water system here in Portland, Oregon. So if you're watching at one of the other stations that broadcasts our programs on a regular basis, while much of the information might be pertinent to you, it's particularly appropriate for people here in Portland, Oregon. Exactly. Right, okay. And, uh, but the questions about fluoridation certainly could be uh, applicable to almost any city in the, in the United States, many of which do fluorate, uh, fluorate? Fluoridate. Fluoridate, <laughs> fluoridate their water system. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the waiver, and there's an alternative proposal about how to deal with that, and the, the, the word is escaping me. There's a variance. Variance, yes. Talk and about the difference between those two. We are, um, a, a waiver is a permanent situation. Currently, we are, are under a waiver from, at this point, for filtration called the filtration avoidance determination which allows the, the EPA has given us a waiver from, from filtering because our water is so pure. So that's, we, we like that and we'll keep that for, forever because it's, it's so, our water is so good. Um, so we're asking a waiver for the treatment that we don't need from the ultraviolet radiation because we're fine just being an unfiltered one with chlorine and ammonia. That's mm -hmm. all we need. And also we don't want to cover the reservoirs. We want a waiver from that. But a variance is a temporary um, situation that the EPA applies to us to, to do continued sampling. There's a, a variance going on right now up at the, reserv up at the uh, Bull Run area in the, in the watershed. So we don't have, they're going to be continuing to sample for cryptosporidium. And if we find one or two cryptosporidium, then we'll have to treat. But that's just not a significant reason for us to treat. So that's the variance that we've talked about that is a temporary situation that the EPA gives to us. What we want is a permanent solution. And we've asked for a uh, variance and a waiver for the open reservoirs, and the EPA and the Oregon Health Authority have denied a variance and have denied a waiver for that uh, to this point. So we're hoping to get the city council, the new city council involved, to listen to us closer, that we, we want a waiver as a community, and we want our congressional people to be involved also, because those are the ones that will be talking to the EPA. Mm -hmm. So write the city council and the congressional delegation telling them you want a, a waiver and all that information for contact is on our borunwaiver.org website. Okay, all right. And, and have you uh, discussed this with city council members here in Portland now since January when the new office or new commissioners, council, whatever their title is? Right. Yes, we have. And right now they're working with uh, the Oregon Health Authority to begin to discuss an extension of covering our reservoirs. That still is up in the air and won't be decided till next month. Uh, last month in March, I testified before the city council to let them know that we did want the waiver and the reasons for it, so they are considering that. Hopefully, we'll get some response from them soon on that. Okay, all right, good, good. So, um, any last words before we close? Well, I would say as far as the fluoridation goes, uh, there's another uh, Facebook site, Clean Water Portland, and that's a good one to look at, and there are other uh, websites or Facebook sites that you can look at also for like um, I'm trying to think of the floor start with the clean water and then they, they will have uh, directions for you to see, see the other sites also right I, th I think fluoride action I think is fluoride the, action is one um, right. okay. I thought that's okay. Right. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. So I, I will I will point out to our to our audience that the Alliance for Democracy did uh, vote on this issue, and we decided that we would oppose fluoridation of, of the city's water. So I want to make that uh, clear to our to our viewers. And, Thank and you. then you recently came to another organization called the Eastside Democratic Club, which has been in existence since the '40s. Uh, they also voted to oppose fluoridation. Right, and the Sierra Club has supported the uh, opposition to it, along with Food and Water Watch, and Columbia Riverkeeper, and the Organic Consumer Association, Food Consumer Association. So, okay. we've got a strong support. Great, good. Thank you very much for being here, Scott. Thank you very much. All right, good. So, our guest today has been Scott Fernandez, talking about the future of Portland, Oregon's water system. We're going to close our program today with a video clip from the folks at We Are Not Broke, a documentary which tells the story of U.S. corporations dodging billions of dollars in income taxes and how seven fed-up Americans take their frustration to the streets and vow to make the corporations pay their fair share. 
Apologists for multinational corporations like to point out that the American corporations are subject to the highest income tax rate in the world. You've all heard this story before, but what's the truth behind this storyline? Watch and see. The U.S. corporate tax rate at 35% is one of the highest in the world now. You know, you look at countries in Europe, they are in the kind of high 20s and low 30s. But most corporations pay far less than that 35% rate. The effective tax rate is a measure of what they really pay. So for a typical corporation that has a lot of multinational activity, their effective tax rate might be in the low 20s or in the teens or even in the single digits. Some of them are paying a negative tax rate on their U.S. earnings because of the things they're doing offshore. They're playing all kinds of games to reduce their U.S. income tax to ridiculously low levels. Basically, every major technology company and every major drug maker in the U.S. relies on the offshore world for a very significant portion of its profits. The Cayman Islands, where uh, you have just in one relatively small building uh, thousands and thousands of post office boxes, in effect, just box numbers. It's called the Ugland House where companies here claim to have an office, even though there's no economic activity that is going on there. The issue of companies shifting income ultimately to tax havens should really be at the top of the agenda right now. So don't forget to contact your U.S. Senator and ask him to support the Cut Unjustified Tax Loopholes Act, that's Senate Bill 268. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com, search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. We want to thank the volunteers who donate their time to get our program on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Ethan Scarro, Brad Leach, Beth Kerwin and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you out there watching. I hope that you'll watch us again next week. Bye.